impression. <laughs> Due to illness, Russell Dunn will not be here tonight. We have guest speaker Russell Dunn. <laughs> we are. All right, praise God. A little bit of a late start, technical difficulties, and we are with you. Kingdom people, how are y'all doing tonight? It is Friday. Uh, today is the day the Lord has made. We are going to do all who are thirsty real quick and do some good, good Father. Songs we all pretty much know. We're talking about divine healing. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about some sacred cows. And uh, hopefully get you motivated to get out of your house, off the couch, and go preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, make disciples. Pretty simple. Pretty easy. Pretty simple. And uh, if you need prayer or we need a prophetic word or you just have questions, comment below. And somebody will give you an answer, prayer, prophetic word. Amen.
Is good. <laughs> all the time. All the time. And all the time. God, God is good. good. You know, we hear that a lot, but it is true. God is good. Amen. And we're going to learn a little bit about tonight um, of how good he is. Uh, we're talking about the atonement, bodily healing and atonement. And I'll post this book uh, up also. Um, I just, shameless plugs in books that have changed my life. But uh, last, last week was uh, Dr. Um, Bill Hammond's book, 70 Reasons for Speaking in Tongues. Awesome, awesome book. But this is uh, Dr. T.J. McCrossan. It's an older book, and it's been re-edited by Kenneth Hagan and Roy Hicks. Um, I have the original one. It's a bigger book that they edited, and I suggest this one. It's more palatable, manageable, more easy to read. And it's called Bodily Healing and the Atonement. Uh, uh, Dr. McCrossan was a... Um, one of doctor, but very good with the Greek and all that, and he explains um, you know, the atonement just very well. So we're going to go over several things that he goes over in this book, uh, but it's a good book to get. Get up off Amazon, I believe, or go to look up Kenneth Hagen. Um, if not, get in touch with me, and we can get you, get you squared away with that. So, no further ado, uh, this is June, June 20, 22, and we're going to talk about in this month, we're going to talk about various aspects of divine healing, and uh, if you want to uh, learn more about uh, how we do things, uh, another plug is uh, John Vick Ministries, Curry Blake out of uh, Texas. He's the one who, who does the DHT, or the Divine Healing Technician, and it changed all of our lives. It's what we went through and got trained in. It takes about three days. You can go to it in person. You can go online, so look it up on YouTube, or the website, Divine Healing Technician. And it's not really what to do or how to do it necessarily. Um, we'll go over how to pray for somebody. But really, it really destroys any doubt, fear, unbelief that you may have. And I had most everything uh, with sacred cows and bad teachings of churches and people and things like that. And no one's really malicious necessarily, but it's a theology of failure. If I pray for somebody and I don't see them get healed, you have to have an answer for something. So a lot of times it's just a failure of bad teaching and the not really understanding the scripture. So um, the DHT goes through all those. It goes through, there's probably at least 33 sacred cows. We'll touch on some of them tonight. Uh, probably the generational curses, which is a big one. So uh, Christians, as Christians, we do not have generational curses. So you do not have to pray away the curses or break them or anything like that. It's, 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 we're going to see by scripture that they are not part of our life. It's not part of the New Testament. You can't preach the atonement, which we'll talk about tonight. You can't preach the new man that we've been talking about for a month and preach generational curses. Your generation goes back to one. Because you died, you were buried, you were given life and raised with Jesus Christ. So you you don't have a lineage other than Jesus. Jesus isn't sick. Come on. Yeah, y'all can help me tonight. Jesus is not sick. Amen. And so your family line does not, there's no curse to that. Amen? So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll chat about that tonight. Uh, let's see. So we'll, we'll just get into it. So um, bodily healing and atonement is mostly where these notes come from. Uh, but we're going to give a lot of scripture because we operate by scripture. Uh, and if Jesus did it, we do it. If he did not do it, we don't do it. So our ministry, your ministry... If you're a believer, raise your hand. If you're a believer, you have a ministry. You have a ministry of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Your ministry needs to look more like Jesus and not less like Jesus. If Jesus never broke generational curses, you don't need to. And a lot of crickets up in here. Come on, come on, Facebook. Come on, live. <laughs> Let's 
get with it. Uh, but what we teach, what the DHT teaches, what John Dick Mystery teaches, and also Andrew Womack, I don't know if he has an actual healing school necessarily, but everything he talks about with healing is pure. It's right out of the Bible. He believes the same way that we do, in a sense. There's probably more camps out there that believe that, but your, your, your belief system needs to be pure and effective. And if you think that there's a hindrance to healing, there's a problem there. So healing is a gift. It is not a reward for what you do or don't do. It is a gift. Everybody in the gospel that Jesus healed was not born again. Some of them did have faith that he could do it, which was great, and he commended them for it. Some of them didn't have faith. You know, how does a dead person have faith? So you can go to anybody, and we've seen, I've seen uh, Buddhist people healed, atheist people healed. I've seen Christians who didn't want to be healed healed. So it's, the, it's not the person that you're dealing with. It's the sickness or the demon that who is pressing that person. Acts 10 38. And Jesus healed every single person. Everyone. You can't mm -hmm. find a place where he did not heal. So scripture also has the match scripture. So if someone believes that he didn't heal the people in his hometown, yet Acts 38 says he healed everybody, that there's a problem there. There's something that doesn't, that doesn't jive. So he did heal all the people in his hometown. He didn't do any big miracles because the Bible doesn't say. But he healed everybody who had, was sick and went to him in his hometown, he healed. The Bible says he healed him. So that's one thing we'll look at probably not tonight, but that's one of the Seder cows is that uh, for some reason you think when you go to somebody and you think that they don't have enough faith and then you can't get them healed, then you're you're defeated already. I think it got strong quick, didn't it? <laughs> Alright, let's go to the atonement. Um, now I want to touch on this because this is why people, that, this is why Christians can heal the sick. It's not just some flim flam, pie in the sky, something. It is, it is legal. We talked about our legal obligation, our constitution, the word of God, uh, our will, our a will as a, a document. So these are the promises of God that He gave us, and this is why this works. Why can people be healed? And why is it a gift? It's because He died on the cross and He was whipped almost to death to take it. So we're gonna look at those. And number one is, uh, so uh, begin, I'll give you four reasons about the atonement, why, uh, why we can heal the sick. One is the atonement. Number two, God is unchangeable. He does not change. His covenants change, but he doesn't change. And that's, that's a big kind of a trip up with some people is, if God did it over here, but didn't do it over here, it's, it's the way the covenants were set up. The Old Testament, God could not do with man what he wanted to do. They were sin. They were sinful. The New Testament, the New Testament, the New Covenant made it was able to make man holy again. That's why we get the Holy Spirit. Hmm. God is not going to pour His Holy Spirit into a corrupt vessel. Yeah. That's why He had to kill you, wow. bury you, raise you up with Jesus, and you now you're in Christ. Now He can put His holy everything holy. 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 The Holy Spirit yeah. is holy. He put His Holy Spirit in you because you're a holy vessel. The blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That'll preach right there. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's about an hour of that. Come on. That's now. good. So the atonement, God is unchangeable. Uh, number three, Jesus died to take our sickness and our sin. We'll touch on that. Um, sickness is a result of Satan and the fall. And a little bonus is the Holy Spirit lives in us. The same spirit that lived in Jesus lives in us. Come on. So every miracle that Jesus did, we can do because it's not us necessarily doing it. We're in partnership. It is the Holy Spirit who does it. So we lay hands and the Holy Spirit heals. We lay hands and people rise from the dead. We lay hands and demons flee. Amen? Amen. We lay hands and lepers are, are healed. So but that's who does it. But he does it through us. Like Samson, Samson killed more enemies in his death than he did in his life. So, uh, Jesus did the same thing. So when Jesus was walking around the earth, Satan only had one son to fight. And then he died. Beloved, we are now the sons of God. Small s, but we're the sons of God. So if God has many sons and daughters, sons, mankind, who can walk, talk like Jesus did. And our, our ministry, our, our, uh, what we're going to do is help believers walk in that. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So, the atonement. All right, so God is unchangeable. Exodus 15, 26, you can go there or just write it down. Exodus 15, 26 says, I am the Lord God who heals 
and restore you. That's where we get Jehovah Rapha from. Everybody remember that name, Jehovah Rapha? He heals. He Not only does he heal, that's his name. So he is a God who heals. He even made our bodies to heal. You ever cut yourself and your body heals? He made you to heal. Healing is something that God wants to do. God wants to restore. God wants to make right. So even in our in our physical body, he made us to be able to heal ourselves, in a sense. Amen? So he always wants to heal. He just couldn't do it exactly how he wanted to in the Old Testament. But now that Jesus came, come on. When Jesus came, that is the picture, that is the character and the image and likeness of the face of God. So how Jesus did it, he expressed the character of God. And so he healed everyone. Everyone. Amen? Amen. Amen. It was a whosoever. Who, whosoever came to him, he healed. And we're going to see that salvation and healing, it's not one and the same, but it's the same component in a sense. Because if he wants everyone to be saved, amen, he, amen. God wants everybody to be saved, he wants everybody to be healed. It's all in the same time frame. When he died on the cross, he died to take our sin. When he was whipped, he took and bore our sickness, our grief, our sorrow, our condemnation, our disease. Come on, somebody. So if you have that, he took it. So if you have it, it's actually illegal for you to have it. Mm. In a legal sense. Amen. Because Jesus took it. Mm -hmm. All right. Exodus 23, 25 says, So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. And he says, I will take away sickness from the midst of you. So in the Old Testament, God wanted to take sickness away from them. Psalm 103, one of our favorite ones, and uh, very familiar one, Psalm 103, 1 through 6. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits or promises. Who? This is Old Testament. This is King David in the Old Testament. Who forgives some of your iniquities. All. Who forgives all your iniquities. Who heals some of your diseases. All of your diseases, who redeemed your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Put your hand on yourself somewhere and say, I am crowned with loving kindness and tender mercies. And tender mercies. I feel holy here. Mm. You can pray for yourself. You can lay hands on yourself and be blessed. Amen. Remember when I first started learning this, we've been walking in this. The the DHT and the Bound Healing Technician from John Felix uh, ministry for about over 10 years. Uh, when I first, when we first started learning, um, my knees hurt just all the time. I don't know what was going on with them, but it, it just hurt. So I, I couldn't do squats. I couldn't really move very well with my knees. And so I remember being at a park and I was just walking to my car and the Lord said, why don't you just pray for yourself? I'm like, well, why not? So I did. Actually, I was in the middle of the street and I, I put my hands on my knees I said, pain, go right now in Jesus' name. And I felt it go. I was like, whoa, this does work for, you, you know, for yourself. So I, was, I started walking around and the pain was gone. And I never had that pain ever again. I'd do squats and run and do all kinds of stuff. So ever since that moment, I've been completely healed. Uh, one of the questions we get a lot of times is if you pray for somebody and they get healed, even yourself, when I say somebody, anybody, and, and, and it comes back, why does that happen? Well, the enemy is just attacking you again with the same thing. So what do you do? You just pray again, or you command it again, right? And we'll, we'll, uh, at the end, I'll show you how to pray. It's not that hard. If you don't ask God for something he's already done, you do it like Jesus. And Jesus either touched the person or he commanded it. So that, that's how you pray for people. It's easy. Um, the, the difference. Even John Gillick, minister, John Gillick, the man himself, said that he was uh, corresponding with a group of churches and said, hey, th this, is, this is the ticket. This is, the, this is when you know someone has it. When they command, they use God's power and authority. We talked about that last week in speaking to the saints, speak to the sickness, speak to the cancer, speak to whatever it is, and tell it what you want it to do. Amen. So you're taking God's power and authority, which He gave you, and exercising dominion over the earth, whether it's sickness or devil or tornadoes or whatever it is. Amen. So that, that's one of the biggest leaps, leaps. So that's the biggest mind change that we have to see in the Christian body is actually taking God's power and authority and exercising it properly. Amen? Amen. All right, so God wants to take our sickness away from us. All right. Uh, we continue with Psalm 103. Uh, 
Uh, he forgives all of our iniquities. He heals all of our diseases. He redeems our life from destruction. He's crowned us with loving kindness. And turns, this could be like a morning devotional. This is really good news. This is awesome. Yeah. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. So that your youth is renewed like an eagle. So I'm getting a little bit older, so I need my youth renewed like an eagle. Come on now. Amen. Who's saying anyone away? I'm still so young. Alright. So your, 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 your youth, I can't even speak. Uh, your youth is renewed like the eagles. Um, I'll fly like an eagle. Come on. Come back and pancake. Uh, the Lord executes. This is where people usually stop, is right there. But read the next verse. It says, The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Think about that. He executes righteousness and justice. So we need to go to court, and the judge, he, he favors your side. Judgment can be good or bad. It's a neutral word. If he favors or makes judgment in your case, in your favor, that's a good thing. You either won the case or you got off or whatever it was. So the Lord executes. He executes righteousness and justice for who? Some who are oppressed. All, all who are oppressed. So who is oppressed? Who does the oppressing? Acts 10, 38. The devil goes over. He, he oppresses people. So you can put whatever, fill in the blank, whatever oppresses. It could be money. It could be crazy people. It could be sickness, it could be disease, it could be whatever it is, if the enemy is oppressing you, and we're going to see in a minute that that's how sickness got in, was through sin and Satan. It wasn't God's idea or his will. So the enemy oppresses, but God does what? He executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. So when he heals people, he's fulfilling his work. Righteousness and justice. It is not right that this person has cancer. It's not right. Sickness and sin came in through the fall. It's not right. So God is going to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I have favor in your case. My judgment is healing. That's what Amen. that's what he does. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is eternally changeless. This is amplified. Jesus Christ is eternally chainless, changeless. And it says always. It's just a neat word. He always, he always is. He always was. He always were. I don't even know grammarly how that works, but he always has been. Jesus has always been. And it says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if Jesus is always in God, Jesus, God, and Holy Spirit, if they are always Jehovah Rapha, they are always the God that heals. He's never going to say no, especially in the, in the New Testament. Now that Jesus' blood has been shed, he's taken that. Physically, literally, legally, he's never going to say no. All the promises of God are yes, yes and, and amen. amen in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. He's always saying yes. He cannot say no. He can't. There's no possible way. When we're talking about kingship and things like that. When a king, and we're talking about naturally, when a king decrees something, that's what it is. It cannot be changed. And God, the king, is the same way, especially with him, because when he says something, he creates. So when he spoke light into existence, light be, that's what it became. Hmm. So if he, because he said it, that's what it is. And that's how God operates. So when he said, by your stripes, they are healed, bam, that's what it is. It cannot change. He, that's why you cannot say no. Jesus will heal me. He will never say no. He'll never say wait. It's, it's yes and amen in Christ Jesus. It's always his will. He's never going to say no. Never. That's so good. Uh. In fact, I don't have it written down, but Isaiah, remember the famous scripture where it says, uh, my word will not return and be void, but it will go and accomplish what I sent it. That's how God works. When he says it, boom. It, it's going to accomplish what he sent it to do. I sent my word and gave him sickness. No. I sent my word and I healed them. Amen. So now take a step from being just a regular human and being a new creature in Christ. That we are a new species on earth. Yes, we're human, but we have a divine nature. Now what we say 
in when it lines up with God's word, that's what it becomes. That's the power of our voice. Hmm. So not only does it work with authority and power, it works with creating things. So in James, it talks about the, the rudder of the ship is very small, but it steers a gigantic ship. That's why the tongue is so powerful, because what you say, that's what happens. And most of us are so double-minded and so wishy-washy and so to cost to and fro, we just kind of, it's like a gargle with gunpowder and we start shooting our mouths off. It's a joke. It's a so joke. we start gargling with gunpowder and start shooting our mouths. That would be really good. Come on. Lord, 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 Lord. Not but you know what I'm saying. We, we, we have the word in us, but what are we actually saying that is lining up with the word of God? And I have to put my hand up. Sometimes I say stuff that's just, it's just crazy. It's not really good. And I have to repent and back up and say, all right, this is what it's going to be. And this is the will of God. And forget all the stuff I just said. Amen. Mm-hmm. All right. And as we keep going, all right. So that's just one point. So I, I like to paint a picture with several pegs. That's just one peg. God is changeless. He does not change. His covenants did, but He doesn't. In fact, we've got a better covenant. And we can go through all the Hebrews and Zechariah and, and Jeremiah and talk about the new covenant, how better, what a better covenant that is. Amen. So now that we have a new covenant, he's not going to have another one. This is the perfect one. Amen. So it's not going to change. So everything that God wanted to do with the human race, everything that God needed to be restored, was restored through Jesus Christ. Now, being restored, that's why we see crazy stuff going on. And, you know, I'm not going to name everything, but anything, anything evil, anything that the enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy, that is the enemy's camp. And it needs to be stopped. Yeah. But who stops it? The body of Christ. Because when we say something and go expand God's kingdom, it shuts down all his crap. Amen? Who wants to go to hospitals and just clean them out? It's possible. We're going to read in the book of Acts that one man went down to Samaria and changed the whole city. One spirit-filled man. He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't special. He was a spirit-filled man. We live in Richmond, Virginia. We can go downtown. We can change Richmond. How? Programs? Programs aren't bad. Food drives, they're not bad. It is preaching the gospel, signs and wonders, changing lives, and kicking the devil's butt. Amen. 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 <laughs> my, one of the, what week was it? You're going to raise hell. R A Z E. Raise it. Means yeah. utterly destroyed and polarized. Amen. Okay. And I feel the Holy Ghost, because there's another scripture that says God's word is like fire and a hammer, and it polarizes the enemy. Mm-hmm. So your words can polarize. Not just hit, not just, you know, knock a knot outside his head. You can pulverize the enemy. Mm-hmm. And when you're praying for people or praying for things, you just want, you don't want to just punch it. You want to pulverize it. You want to manny pack you out of that thing. You know what I'm saying? You're some other UFC fighters. You want to Mike Tyson that thing. You want to pulverize it, and that thing is not getting up. Amen? I do not want to be hit by Mike Tyson. How is he? He's like 90 years old. I still don't want to be hit by that man. <laughs> That's how you want to be in the spirit. You want to be Mike Tyson. That's not a great example. You want to be Evander Holyfield in the spirit. You know what I'm saying? When the enemy is coming or you go attack the enemy, you want to pulverize them. With the word of God, the blood of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. And there's ways to be effective in those. So that's another thing we do is train people how to be effective. You don't want to be just a regular army guy. You want to be a special forces Ranger, Green Beret, Delta Force type. Who, who do you want to come to your rescue? Who, who do you want to come to your rescue? The, the boot camp army guy? Or do you want the Delta Force, Green Beret, Ranger? Well, the Special Forces, baby. They, they, mm-hmm. they are trained well. They are effective. They are strong. That's who you want to come to your rescue. So in the spirit, in the body of Christ, we are an army. So we want to be effective, we want to be strong, we want to be uh, um, not concerned necessarily with the care of this world, and go in and do our job. Amen? Amen. Amen. How we got in that tangent, but let's go. All right, um, the next one. Uh, he died to take our sin and sickness. Isaiah 53, very uh, common scripture. Um, and my notes, uh, I kind of Greeked it, uh, Russellized it, Hebrewed it, and just kind of looked it up. So. It says in Isaiah 53, and I'll tell you a story in a minute about being in Israel and how much I learned about the Old Testament by being in Israel. 
It says he took, everybody say took. Yeah. He took and bore our suffering on him. Come on now. He took and bore our suffering on him and felt our pain for us. Carry our sorrows and carry our sickness. We saw him suffering and thought God was punishing him and afflicting him. But he was wounded for all the wrong that we did. Even in my sin, Jesus died for me. Amen? Even when I was down in all them Jack Daniels and Cherry Cokes and trying to kill myself with alcohol, Jesus died for me. He did that for me way back then. Amen? He took it. But he was wounded for the wrong we did, our transgressions. He was crushed. Everybody say crushed. Crushed. He was crushed for the evil that we did or our iniquities. The punishment which made us well. The word well means everything. Body, soul, spirit. Well. We're well-rounded. We're fully healed physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Brought us wholeness and peace. Everybody say peace. Peace. That's one of the, that's one of the promises of God, is having that peace. The punishment was given to him, and we are healed because of his wounds. Mm -hmm. This is laceration and strikes. I don't know how many times they did, but they whipped him pretty much almost to death, mm -hmm. and it took, I don't care if it took, it took all. It didn't take 85% of them. It didn't take 50% of them. It took every single disease and sickness from them strikes. Amen? So he actually took it. So, Lord, come up here. If I have the sickness, this one would stand right here. So this is sickness, and I have it. I have cancer. But you're Jesus, and you take it. Now, who has it now? Jesus has it now, because he took it and carried it. So I don't have it. Legally, I don't, I don't have to have it. And now, then Jesus put it on the cross. Amen? Thank you. That's all I'm going to show you. If somebody has it. Somebody has the cancer. Jesus took it. Legal, it's been done, and Satan can't do anything about it. He, Jesus took it. Not only did he take our sickness, but he read through here, he took our Amen. guilt, he took our pain, Amen. he took our suffering. So every transgression, every iniquity, he took on his body and then nailed it where? To the cross. To the cross. Amen? Amen? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Amen? All right, first Peter is the sister, New Testament version of this. He personally bore our sin in his own body on the tree, that we might die or cease to exist to sin. Cease to exist to sin. So before Jesus, you were sin. Not only were you sinful, and there's a bunch of sin stuff, I raised my hand at three feet. You were sin. You could not receive the Holy Spirit. You were sin. But what did Jesus do? When he died on the cross, he made you cease to sin. And there's three Hebrew words and Greek words of sin. The fall, the sin of the fall, the sin nature, and like an act of sin. I go still one off. That's, that, that's a sin. So there's three different types of sin. The general sin of the fall, the nature of man, like a sinful nature of man before Jesus, and then the act of sin. Something you did or so. Amen. And so when you read the scripture, you need to understand that because even though you are a new creature in Christ, you talked about the dual nature, you only have one nature. You have a righteous, complete, perfect nature. Even though you might go sin, I might be a Christian and take $20 out of the tithe, that's a sin. But I realize that and I repent, and Jesus is always there to accept my repentance and forgive me. And but it doesn't make you a sinful person. Because we can do a test. Let's do it real, let's do it real quick. And usually when I go around teaching, I do this. And it takes time because I want you to see something, but we'll just do it kind of quick. All right. Who here thinks they can not sin for 10 seconds? Raise your hand. Yeah? All right, let's try it. We'll make it a while. All right. Ready, set, go. Don't sin. Who here can not sin for a minute? Mm -hmm. All right, go for it. 
refueling now. All right, fast forward some minutes. All right, good. All right, who here can not sin for 30 minutes? All right, three, two, one, go. All right, fast forward, so it's 30 minutes. All right, so we can do it, right? Because we have a righteous nature. That's our nature, is not to sin. So, you know what I'm saying? So our nature is not to sin, even though we might go commit a sin. You shouldn't, but if you do, you have grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. You might commit that sin because your mind's not renewed. And I was telling myself, I have, I'm getting better, but finances are, are a struggle with me sometimes. Because, you know, you get this weird bill or something crazy, and I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to pay for this? So, not that I've sold $20 out of the past, that's not what I'm talking about, but there's something in me that isn't quite renewed the money where God is going to supply all my need. So if by chance, um, you know, I see the tie plate, I'm like, I need a $20 to go pay my parking bill or something like that. If I go do that, is that a sin? Yes. I just stole money to go pay for the bill or whatever it is. But if your mind is renewed, instead of doing that old nature, that old thought, I'm going to think, all right, I don't need to take money. God is going to supply my need according to his riches and glory. You see how it works? You can use that across the board. you got to change that lie or that old nature thinking into the new uh, the new, Thank you. The new man thing. Does that make sense? It's called renewing the mind. That's something we do. We go over scriptures, we start practicing it, we get rid of whatever old thoughts about healing, about finances, whatever it is, and we start applying the word and start walking in power. Amen. That's why it says, put on a new man. We put on a new man, and now start thinking like a new man. Amen. And that whole phrase in Greek, putting on a new man, is actually put on the thoughts of the new man. And the new thoughts are the Bible, Jesus, how Jesus is love. Amen? Amen. All right. And if you think that's going to happen overnight, eh, it's not going to happen. It can happen quickly. You can make it go as fast as you want. And it depends on how dedicated you are to whatever you're trying to renew your mind to. Um, but it'll take a little bit of time. All right. All right, so I, what, what I want you to see is even before the cross in Isaiah, they're predicting, he's prophesying that Jesus is going to take that sickness. And in 1 Peter it says he did. So by his stripes we are healed, by his stripes we were healed, somewhere we is healed. Amen? <laughs> so we are healed legally, documentation-wise, he did it. Satan's been stripped of all his power. He even says powers and principalities, uh, they are disarmed. Somebody say disarmed. 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 They are disarmed. In fact, death, where is your shame? Amen? All right. Uh, fast forward a little bit to John 6. John 6, 35 says, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He didn't say, I'm the bread of sickness and disease. <laughs> He is not the bread. He's not. He's not the bread of sickness and disease. He's not the bread of death. He is the bread of bread of life. For whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We just sing a song. All who are thirsty. If you don't know the Lord, He will fill you up. He will change your life, fill you, and you won't be thirsty. You'll be filled with His power and His Spirit. Amen. All right, Matthew eight. 16 through 17. Uh, when the evening came, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word. So he said something. Devil, go in Jesus' name. Boom. They were healed, or the devil went, whatever it was. Russell, how do you know it's a devil? Uh, I don't care. It doesn't matter if it's the devil, a devil, a little demon, an imp. Uh, I don't care if it's on his forehead or his toe or his pinky. It doesn't matter. It, whatever it is, whatever is oppressing that person, has got to go. Yeah. Where does it go? Just go. I don't have to name where they need to go. Just go. It knows to go. And as you start walking in that power and authority, as you know it, they know it. And sometimes you'll go to pray for people and the devil will get healed by you walking next to them. Because the devils are actually scared of us. They tremble. Not because of us, but guess what? We are in Christ. Amen? And they tremble at him and his name. Come on now. They tremble at his name. Matthew 8, 16. When they even came, 
they brought to him many who were demon possessed and cast the spirits out, but they were. And he healed some. Oh. He healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. So Matthew is confirming the prophecy of Isaiah, saying this is a physical thing. Some people think it was a spiritual thing that he was doing, but it is a physical thing. He wants you well, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, the whole Right. He wants it all. He has done it all. He paid for it all. Amen? So he's, uh, Matthew is just saying, hey, this, this, he's doing this. He's fulfilling these words that were spoken. And rewind a little bit to Isaiah. I, when I was in Israel, I worked for a year in a black kosher restaurant. That means they have the uh, Orthodox Jews back there to make sure everything's kosher and cooked right and all this stuff. And they have you know the curls and the black hats and all this stuff. The that actual owner of the restaurant were really cool. They were they they were Jewish, but they you know they were reformed. You know what I mean? They were, they were easy going, cool. But because they were a black kosher restaurant, they had to have that. It's called mashkia, and he had to be there to make sure everything was uh, all all kosher. And uh, no pun intended, really, to make sure everything was uh, up to speed. So um, at first, and when I worked there, I worked there for a year, and. They knew what I believed. I wasn't outgoing necessarily with everything I believed, but you know, one on one, I would talk to people, and you know, they're all Jewish and Old Testament stuff and all like that. But they they knew I was a Christian. They knew how I believed, so we had some interesting discussions. But the Mishkia, he was actually really really cool, and he and I would work in the back sometimes, cutting up food or whatever it was, and he and I would just go back and forth in a nice way and just trying to figure each other out and what we believed. Mm -hmm. He knew I believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And so I would, um, I would just ask him questions because because he was a Mishkia, an Orthodox Jew, he knew the Old Testament word. When I say word for word, word for word, because for years they go to the yeshiva and they, they learn the Old Testament. And I say I would say you know what's what's Malachi two five and he just blurt it out and you know I just kind of test him on stuff. But he knew the Old Testament like word for word. And uh, so I, I, I learned so much from him, but also the, the Jewish brothers who had the thing. Uh, most of their families um, were killed in the Holocaust, but their mom and dad lived there. And I used to take care of their dad sometimes, and he had been through, I think it was Auschwitz. Um, but all his, everybody in his family was killed. It was just him and his wife, and uh, maybe one or two other people, but pretty horrific. And, you know, had the tattoo on his arm and numbers and all that stuff. Anyway. Um, where are we going with it? Oh, so I would ask the Mishvia, I was like, what, is, what do y'all believe? Because they believe the Old Testament, but they believe a Messiah is coming. I'm trying to figure out, why don't y'all believe that Jesus is the Messiah? And so I, I got so much good information from him um, of, of how the Jewish thought was. And uh, I could go on for a while with what that is, but in, in this case, I was like, don't y'all ever read like the prophecies of the Messiah. And he's like, yeah. I was like, well, isn't it pretty specific of who this person is and when they're coming and all that stuff? And he's like, yeah. But I was like, in Isaiah 53, doesn't it, 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 it shows that this Messiah is going to suffer and, you know, the nails in his hands with other scriptures. And there's over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus or the Messiah. And he's like, it, but he, they always brush it off as, in this case, in Isaiah 53, they, they think it's the state of Israel. It's the people of Israel personified in the scriptures. They don't think it's the Messiah. They especially don't believe it's Jesus. Uh, they think he was a heretic and a blasphemer and stuff like that. They, they it really leave a sour taste in their mouth talking about Jesus um, because of what they think he was. But they, they think it was either another prophet or, and, and this is what the Mashiach thought, he's like, this, this is Israel. We, we are the people who are to suffer. So anytime you saw the suffering servant or the suffering Messiah, they equate it to Israel as a whole. So that's kind of the thought. Um, so I learned another thing. Remember um, John the Baptist, uh, he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, hey, uh, are you the one or is there somebody else coming? He never had a doubt that Jesus was the Lamb of God. There was a thought back then that there was two Messiahs. One was going to be the lamb who was being slain and with the Old Testament 
Prophets Prophecy, and they thought there was another one. They didn't know if it was one of the same or two different things, but there's a king that comes. So John the Baptist, he didn't doubt that Jesus was the Messiah that was going to be slain and suffer and all these things. He didn't know if there was another one coming who would be the king who would take over Rome and lead them to all, you know, the victory and all these different things. So they didn't understand that this one Messiah was coming. It's like one person, two different times. They didn't understand. So that, that's kind of a misconception sometimes. People say, well, John lost faith. He didn't, no, he didn't. He, he understood. He just didn't understand fully what was going on. So, and that's a thought in Jewishism. Jewishism? Jewishness? Jewish thought? <laughs> Uh, um, that's one of their misconceptions about the Messiah is which one is it? Is it one person? Is it two people? What's going on? So uh, there's not a complete understanding. Uh, that's, uh, that was extra. That's, you know, extra. <laughs> Real. Um, all right. Thank you. Also, and when I worked at the restaurant, we would do the feasts, the, the seven feasts of Jew. It was awesome. It was like a feast of tabernacles, and it was, it was really cool. So, anyway, because all those were signs that actually point to Jesus. So I'd, I'd be like, in the tabernacle, they had all this, uh, all these palm leaves everywhere, and then people would be sitting outside and eating and stuff like that. And I'm like, you understand, this is Jesus. And they're like, what? Like, he is the tabernacle. He is the word of God made flesh. And they're like, yeah, they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just cool, because it's a, all those taver- all those feasts are a picture of what he did. Like the Passover, obviously, Jesus is the Passover. Anyway, um, I was a good worker, so they kept me, but I would, I would, <laughs> I'd reach out a little bit and show them uh, some of the scriptures. Anyway, all right, so uh, point three is, uh, everybody following pretty good? Uh, God doesn't change. He bore sickness and sin on his body, and this is, sickness is a result of Satan's work. So God never wanted sin and sickness. He didn't want that. He made, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, he made the garden of Eden. It was good, it was pure, holy. But who, who, who messed it all up? Adam and Eve. Eve, man. It was a. Uh, it was equally <laughs> your fault. Um, I pick on men. You're you're there to guard and pay attention, and not just be like um, I'm not thinking about anything. And not all this other stuff. So it, you know, what I'm we have to be protective and watchful, and actually tend. The word in there to watch is to tend and cultivate. Cultivate. This goes. This goes into a marriage thing. We need to cultivate our wife's heart. Come on now. We're the men. We need to watch and cultivate <laughs> our wives. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so sickness is a result of Satan's work. Romans five. This is kind of a long verse, but I'll I'll, I'll run through it. Very important. Um, all the Bible is awesome, and uh, the first night we're talking about some sort of favorite books. Mine's the Ephesians, but man, there's so many good ones. But if you ever just want to dig deep into the Word and understand a lot of this, Romans 4, 5, 6, 7 is really good. It's just really good about the blood and just a lot of this stuff. So anyway, uh, Romans 5, 12 through 19. Therefore, just as through one man, who is that one man? Adam. Sin entered the world. Death through sin. So how did death get in? Through Adam. And death through sin. And thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned, because we're all born of, in the natural, Adam. For until the law, sin was, was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned, say reign. Reign. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, because we have a sin nature now, of the fall, who is a type, Adam is a type of him who is to come. But the free gift, touch your neighbor and say free gift. Free Free gift. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many, or abounded to all, all who would come to him. And this gift is not like the one who came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from the offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through that one, much more. Everybody say much more. Much more. 
when something breaks, God always makes a bone. Amen. Always. You can see that when you break a bone and it starts healing, it actually heals stronger than it was Amen. before. So God, God's always making things better or abundant or lavish. Amen. Uh, for, uh, for the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For by one man's offense, death reigned through that one. Much more, much more, those who receive abundance of grace. Raise your hand if you have received abundance of grace. Yes. And the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So what Adam did, how death and sin and sickness came in through the fall through Adam, what did Jesus do? He got he, he reversed all of that. So those who are in Christ now reign righteously. They reign in life through the one, Christ Jesus. In Christ. In whom? Through him. In Christ. Amen? Amen. Therefore, as the one man's offense, judgment came to all men. Judgment came how? Through Adam. Resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, what man? Jesus, his righteous act, we just read about it in Isaiah and for Peter. That righteous act, that free gift came to some men, all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many were be made righteous. Tell yourself every day, I am righteous. And the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not because of what I did, because of what He Amen. did. Amen. And now walk, walk it out. Walk at that righteousness. What is righteousness? Right standing with God Amen. and doing right things. Amen. 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 Alright, first John 3 8. For who sins is of the devil. For who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So what are the works of the devil? Anything you see, it, he steals, he kills, and destroys. Anytime you see that, that is a work of the devil. And so you go fix it. Amen? Amen. So who sinned from the beginning? Yeah. The devil. That's why when Adam sinned, that he that whole dominion thing shifted over to the devil. Because the devil is actually the first one who sinned. Remember, he's the archangel in heaven, mm -hmm. the worship leader. And he's like, I'm going to be like that. Bam! As soon as he thought that, <laughs> I kicked him out. <laughs> I'm so wonderful. I'm praising God. I'm the best. I'm the best. I don't, I don't, I don't be the best. I don't be God. Boom! He kicked him right out. And the third of the angels were like, I'm going to go with that. So, mm -hmm. Satan is the one who first sinned the, the rebellion. Amen? Amen? Because pride was found in his heart. Alright, keep going. Everybody good? Everybody need a stretch? Right, I'm, put, I'm painting a picture. I'm putting those, those nails in. So when you go out of here, you, have, you know your legal documents of, of why we can do these things. Alright? Alright, the same... Alright, is this, is, this, is this right? Oh, wait. Yeah. Correct on the last page. Alright, we're doing good. We are doing good. All right, so the last kind of point I want to bring is, all right, the same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus is in us. It is in Him I live, I move, and I have my being. Okay. I am joined with the Lord. He who is joined with the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. That kind of sounds weird, but when God... When God raised you from the dead and He asked Jesus into, his, into your heart, what happened to your spirit? It became alive. The Holy Spirit came down and, and lived inside of you. How does that work? I, I, I don't know. We'll get the answers in heaven. But it says your spirit and the Holy Spirit are joined and they're one. Okay, and you're now a holy vessel. The Holy Spirit can live inside of you, and that's how it works. It's not like two different things. It's one. Amen. Very good. Your spirit is complete. It is holy. It is righteous. It's one with the Lord. You got to work on your thinking, thinking. That's how all your mind renewal works. Your soul has to be worked out. And that's the sanctification process. But you are one with the Lord. In Him I live, I move, and I have my being. Jesus said, "Those who believe in Me will do greater works than I. Greater works than Jesus." Hey, sign me up. I'm on board. That's awesome. Come on now. All right. 
Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of the Lord, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Mortal body is your physical being, your, your earth suit. Not your face suit, your earth suit. You need a suit to walk around on earth. That's our physical body. To give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. That's why praying in tongues is so powerful. The more you pray in tongues, the more your spirit is just energized and it's like a radar that just kind of gets, almost like it's bigger, but I guess it could. It just radiates out. So as you pray in tongues, you're building yourself up. You're building an edifice. You're building a foundation. So when you build a skyscraper, you build a foundation for how high you want the edifice or the structure of the skyscraper. So that's what praying in tongues does. And I don't have verses, but we'll talk about them. When you pray in tongues, you edify yourself or build in an edifice or a structure. Praying in tongues just it makes you the uh, hope of a Christian song or Bruce Banner. It was David Banner, wasn't it? From the 70s. Remember that old Luke Rigno was the Hulk? And was it David Banner or Bruce Banner? I don't know why I'm even getting tied up on Bruce or David Banner. David. Uh, anyway, I don't get the Hulk in my head. Oh, so when you pray in tongues, you become stronger and bigger in spirit. So when that happens, you can pray and your spirit can actually. Heal your own physical body. Um, it works better the prescribed way, which is laying on hands and speaking to it. But the gifts of healings, I'm not going to get into that. Anything that's outside of speaking to it or laying your hands on it is considered a gift of healings. You can play your, your, the guitar and people get healed. That's a gift of healings. You can you know, run around the building seven times and people get healed. That's a gift of healings. Is that God? Yeah. It's just it's different. It's a different prescribed way. Um, the prescribed way is how Jesus did it. He spoke to things and already laid hands on them. Amen? Amen. And what, what are some other ways that people can heal? Oh, you, you can declare the word like the scripture over and over and over and over and over and bam, you heal. That's kind of a slow way, but it works. If that works, whatever works, great. But you want to be more effective. Amen? Alright. 1 John 2, 27. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. Who's been born again? Raise your hand. If you're born again, you have received the anointing. I'm not talking necessarily about the baptism of the Spirit, but when you receive Jesus, you receive the anointing. And then the Holy Spirit is the anointing. And you might have a little drop in you, but you want to be overflowing from the baptism of the Spirit. And then, so the anointing abides in you. You have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things. So why do you go to church? Why is there a fivefold ministry? Why is there these teachings that are aligned are so good and, and pure and effective? Well, if you would study and listen to the Holy Spirit, you would come to the same truth or conclusion. These people who went before us, Curry Blake, David Hogan, Tom Sorella, and Lauren Miller, they just did it. They did it and are able to explain it and, and show it better in a quicker, faster way. It took, it took Curry Blake, I think, Three decades to get to understand what he knows. And then he just teaches it in three days because it's concise, it's effective, bam. But it's the Holy Spirit. You go to the you go to these places, you can feel the Holy Spirit teaching you, saying, Yes, that's true, that's true, that's true. Amen. Amen. That's good. So you can get it by yourself, but God made the fivefold ministry to do it quicker. Amen. Amen. Right. But, um, but as his anointing teaches you about some things. All things. It is true and not a lie. Just as he has taught you, you abide in him. So he, we're, the, we're the vines, he's the branch. No, we're the branches, he's the vine. Let me correct me if I'm wrong. We're the branches, he's the vine. Anyway, we're connected, we're connected with him. So he's the vine, we're the branches. Yes, that's how it works. It's a tree, and you have vine, and you have branches. Right? Alright, so we're, we're connected with him. So keep. <laughs> connected with connected with him. I can get a hold of you. Alright, we're good. Alright, so abide in him. Touch your neighbor and say, abide in him. Abide in him. Abide in him. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, that's basically what I want to talk about legally. Does everybody understand legally? That's what Jesus did. That's how God is. He's unchangeable. <laughs> Jesus took these things. Sin and sickness and disease entered through Satan. 
and then God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of us, and we can do the same things He did because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Amen? You understand the power that lives in you? The same power that raised Jesus. How much power did it take to raise Jesus from the dead? I, I don't know. Some, I don't know. Whatever power that was lives inside of us. So whatever broke that stone and exploded and light and all that stuff, whatever raised him from the dead, that same power lives inside of you. You have dynamite inside of you. You have dunamis inside of you. Put somebody to say you got TNT inside of you. You got TNT inside. Remember that ACDC? TNT, dynamite, TNT, out of sight. But anyway, um, TNT, you got dynamite, you got explosive power inside of you. So now you have to learn how to release those things. Amen? All right. Uh, let's go to, um, we're going to do a couple more scriptures where we see how power authority works uh, through Jesus and through book of Acts. We're going to kill the bigger cow. And if anybody's online and wants a prophetic word and uh, needs healing or something like that, we're going to do that. And we have a team here that will uh, uh, do it live. So we're going to go to, or, I already have it. Uh, Matthew, go to Matthew. I want you to see this. So if you're online or here, I want you to go to Matthew 8, 5 through 13. Matthew 8, 5 13. This is about the centurion. Very famous story. But this is how power and authority works. And if you're ever in the military, you, you know this. That's why military people on the kind of grab hold of this a little bit quicker because they understand power and authority. Alright, Matthew 8, 5 through 13. If you're there, just yell amen. Right, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? And the centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the, say the word. word. And my servant, oh my, if I had, whew, just say the word, and my servant for I myself, we're going to go back and look at this deeper. For I myself am a man under authority, and with my soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. This is faith right here. There's two places where Jesus commended people on great faith. There was two people who were not in covenant. They were not Jewish. One was a Syrophoenician woman, and the other one was this guy here, the centurion. He is a Roman, he is a Roman centurion. <laughs> he is the enemy. <laughs> and he had great faith. Why did he have great faith? When Jesus had entered Capernaum, the centurion asked, came to him and asked him, Lord, my servant lies home. Where's the servant? Back home. Somewhere else. He's at home. He's not right there. This will this will kill a sacred cow right here. So the person who needed healing was not present. He was somewhere else. And what did he have? He was paralyzed. That's bad. And suffering terribly. Mm. That's horrible. All right, Jesus said, he, that's what he said to him. My servant needs, needs you. And what was Jesus' first response? Let's go. Let's go to your house. Shall we go? Let's go. And heal him. He said, no, no, you don't need to go to my house. Mm. I understand power and authority. If you just say the word, my servant will be healed. That's very good. That's faith. That's how power and authority works. Because who is Jesus? He is the king. Before the foundations of the earth, he was slain. So even though physically in time he had not been to the cross or been whipped, it has already been done. Come on. Amen. It has already been done. You've been appointed to good works before the foundation of the world. I'm preaching to myself right now. You have been appointed to do good works before the foundation of the world. So not so Jesus walking around in a human suit, 
He's not been to the cross. He's not been whipped. But the centurion understands the authority and says, you, you just say the word, my God, you. It's, it's fine. That is amazing. So not only can it's just taken down to another level. So now that Jesus has done all this, he's died, he's in heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit, we received his Holy Spirit, now how does it work? It works the same way that Jesus did. If we say something, that's what it becomes. If we touch something, it's going to have life in it. It's going to get healed. It cannot do anything else. So no matter what you see in front of you, if you pray for somebody and you don't see them instantly healed, life is still going into them. Don't think any differently. It's going to work. It cannot not work. It cannot not work. It has to work because God said it. He has decreed it. He sent Jesus legally to take it. So it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm going to post uh, a couple of pictures. I'm going to have to wipe their eyes out a little bit. A couple of years ago, I keep telling you, uh, the testimony of the Down Syndrome girl that was healed. I'll, I'll put a picture up there. Um, completely doctor verified Down Syndrome, down to the DNA level, healed. We're praying for um, uh, another guy in England currently. We've been praying for three weeks, five, ten minutes a day, or not a day, five or ten minutes a week. Every Friday morning, he calls on WhatsApp and we pray. And he, he believes like we do. He's going to John Jesus Ministries there in London. So he understands how this works. They're, they're seeing their daughter in front of them change. I'll show you a picture of it. He, he has her, the girl's name is Natalia. She, she, every time I see each week, it's like it's, you can see something is happening. So the first one, it was, a, it was over several months where the, the face changes, the, the tongue gets smaller, the cognitive things start working and things like that. So it works. It cannot not work. Jesus took down syndrome. Hallelujah. He took it. Amen. It's illegal for your babies to have it. Illegal. It is illegal. Jesus. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give life. He's going to give life to Natalia. His promises are yes and amen. He's not going to say no, Natalia. You have, this, you, you have Down syndrome. Too bad. He took it. So he's expecting us to walk in the power and authority to speak that thing. They're in London. I can't lay hands on her, but I can speak to her. Amen. Because it works like this. Amen. You just say the word. They call, they email me. Russell, can you pray for our God? Can you just say the word? Amen. Yeah. I can say the word. I can pray for you. Yeah. I sent a text, I sent an email. I sent an email to somebody who's healed and died either. Then no, then see him, then after prayer, be healed in Jesus' name. They were good. I, I don't understand it. It's just incredible. Greater things you will do. Jesus said, this isn't my teaching. This isn't some concocted thing. This has been written in your Bible for 2,000 years. You're going to do greater things than Jesus because the Holy Spirit has been given to you. Come on. I'm good. taking myself out of your hair. That's good. Amen. All right. Just say the word. Somebody, just, somebody say, say the word. Say the word. <laughs> say the just word. say the word. What do you want to happen? Be healed. Be, be whole. Be fixed. Schizophrenia, go. Whatever it is. Whatever it is stealing and killing and destroying somebody, say it to it. Say the word. Say it. Speak life to it. Amen? Amen. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. And I, in, my, in my notes, I don't have all of it. He said, I, I've never seen such He had, a, he had a Roman soldier who was not in covenant with God, who was the enemy, coming to Jesus and saying, hey, you can do this. You just say the word and this will happen. That, he was just, Jesus was a stop. He probably had to pick me up off the ground. I'm like, what? I'm like, what? What did you just say? All right, go to, this is one of my favorite scriptures. I love this book. Um, Acts 8. Go to Acts 8 and verse, I don't know yet. Verse 4. Acts 8 and verse 4. Now put yourself in Philip's position. This is you. This is you. This is me. Therefore, those who are scattered went everywhere preaching what? The word. 
Not their denomination. I'm getting trouble here. Not their denomination. Not their. I saw on Facebook. I'm not gonna say this. Should I say it? Somebody posted. Um, I'm not gonna say who it was with the book necessarily, but it was. It was a book about. Should I say it? I'm, I'm not getting that. <laughs> All right. So what I'm gonna say is, preach the word. Don't preach any other thing. Preach the word. All right. Because if you want word. If you want, if you want Bible stuff to happen, you're gonna to have to preach the Bible. If you want New Testament stuff to happen, come on, you're gonna to have to preach the New Testament. That's good. And it is the kingdom of God. It is the word. Uh, verse five it says we're in, we're in Acts eight verse five, and then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached what to them? Christ to them. Amen. And the multitudes with them in one accord heeded. The things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, ah! came out of many who were possessed. You like that little sound effect? Came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Samaria was a collection of five villages, basically, and they were, it was demonic. That's not even a word for it. So he, one spirit-filled man, went down and preached Christ to them. He didn't, he didn't get on the phone and say, hey, hey, is Peter there? Is there kind of, do I have permission to do this? Hey, we need, a, we, need a, we need a prayer group to pray for us for 24 hours before we get, go down there. I'm not against prayer. I'm not, I'm not against, a, you know what I'm saying? He just went down there, a spirit-filled man, and preached Christ to them, and they all heard and saw the miracles. And there was great, you want great joy in Richmond? You want great joy in the city that you're in? Portland, Seattle, Memphis, Knoxville, wherever, wherever you're from, you want great joy in the city. This is how to do it. Preach Christ and perform miracles. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, Cast out demons, boom. There's gonna be great joy in the city. Amen. Amen. Alright, I'll be wrapping up here in a minute. Oh, we gotta kill a sacred cow. We got time for that? Yes. Let's yeah, man. Let's kill a sacred cow. Alright. We're gonna kill one of the biggest ones. This thing should be dead, but it's still like on life support, it's still got IVs in it and stuff like that. But we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stomp it until it's pulverized. Generational curses. Oh, I'm gonna get a bunch of emails about this. But we're going to show you strictly how gener generational curses do not exist. If you go online right now, go to Amazon and look up books about generational curses, you will come up with, my last count was, is it 80 something? There's 80, there's probably more. There's, there's at least 80 books on generational curses. You got to do this, and this is why they exist, and blah, 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 all these different things. There's probably one or two that say generational curses don't exist because of this. Well, whether or not you read books or believe whoever the authors are, whatever, we're going to go through scripture, right? Because scripture is the basis of how we do things. So we're, I'm going to paint a real quick picture of generational curses, how they don't exist, especially for the believer, with four pegs. One, two, three, four. Pow! And you're going to see they, well, one, not only do they not exist, but you don't have to go around breaking them and figuring out root causes of whatever, why that person is sick, nothing like that. So, we are going to go to where it all began. Go to Exodus 20. And I picked that because it's more clear. There's other places in the, in the, the Torah where it, it talks about this. But this is where, this is where they get their, their, there's scriptures and cockad theology from. All right. Can I say that? All right. Uh, Exodus 20, in verse 5. We're actually going to go down. We're going to go to verse 4 because it's a complete thing. Verse 4 You shall not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is on earth below, or that is in the water. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Stop right there. That's usually where, well, that's always where they stop. They don't mm -hmm. read the complete scripture. So let's read the complete scripture. All right, what testament are we in? Old. Are you under the old covenant? No. Are you Jewish? No idea. If you are, I mean, it still doesn't matter because we're not in the Old Testament system anymore. We're in the New Testament system. All right. But we're going to show you, even if you were a Jewish, a Jewish person at this time, under the Old Covenant, guess what happened? Here we go. Let's read the whole thing in context. For I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. How far? Third and fourth generations. To those who hate me. Verse 6. But showing mercy to thousands. Those who love me and keep my commandments. So in the Old Testament, raise your hand if you hate God. I'm not going to raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> no one here hates God. Yeah. On Facebook Live, anybody out there hate God? Probably not. All right, so even if you hated God, all right, that, that wouldn't go down but to your third and fourth generation. Still bad, but not awful. All right, but raise your hand if you love God. Right? Everybody raising their hand. On Facebook, do you love God? Alright, which one of these applies to you? If you're Jewish and under the Old, old Covenant. Alright. But showing what? To thousands? Mercy. And to those who love me and keep my commands. Alright. So if you love God, you're going to be showing mercy to, to thousands. Okay? How far? To thousands. Is that really clear? That, that is the crux of the whole issue right there, is they twist or don't completely show in their books or their teachings this right here. Even though, oh, I'm going to keep hammering. If you love God and you're in the Old Testament, God's going to show you mercy to thousands. Okay? He's, it's not, you're, you're not going to be visited with the iniquity of your fathers. It's not going to happen. One or the other. You either hate God or you're not. You're either pregnant or not. Can't be half pregnant. Alright. Then, alright, that's peg number one. Destruction of the sacred cow of the generation of curses. Actually, each one of these pegs would hold up its own, but we're just going to hang out with all four. Alright, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but go to Ezekiel chapter 18. And for fun tonight, you can just go through it and see, make sure what I'm saying is actually what I'm saying. But, and again, in time's sake, I'm not going to read the entire chapter because there's a lot to it. All right, and if you're taking notes, Exodus 20, verse 5, that's peg number 1. Peg number 2 is Ezekiel 18. I'm just going to summarize it, and you're welcome to go back and read the whole thing. And this is where they get the phrase, sour grapes, that the sons are chewing on the sour grapes. Uh, it comes from that, that, genera that generational iniquity is really what it is. And if you read this whole thing, it talks about the father's iniquity and passing on to the son's iniquity, and the son is responsible for the father's iniquity, blah, blah, blah. And, but at the very end of the chapter, he says, no longer are you going to say this parable. No longer are you going to say there's generational iniquity. No longer can you just make excuses of why you're doing whatever. The soul that sins shall die. Yeah. That's the crux of Ezekiel 18. The soul that sins shall die. So if the father sins, he's responsible, nobody else. If the son sins, he's responsible, no one else. It doesn't jump back and forth and go down the lineage or anything. God, God is saying this through Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18. The soul that sins shall die. You cannot say this parable anymore. God said, we are done with it. Okay? That's peg number two. That, that stands by itself. God says, no more. No more of this. What testament are you in? New still the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. This is still in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Alright, so peg number three. Go to Galatians 3.13. And this kind of follows suit to either last week or the week before. We're talking about what was what was placed on Jesus and what was placed on the cross. And we're going to see. 
Galatians 3, 13. I, I dare you to memorize this. I'm not looking at my notes. This is memorized. This is, I don't have my notes up here for this. I know this is my heart. All right, Galatians 3, 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Mm -hmm. So who took the curse? What curse? Any curse. Mm -hmm. The curse of a fall, the curse of Adam and Eve, whatever curse it is, Jesus took it. So if you're a Christian, raise your hand if you're a believer, I'm a believer, filled with the Holy Spirit, well just a believer anyway. If you're a believer, if you're in Christ, you do not have any curse. I, but, but, Russell, I feel like I got curse. I got this from my dad, and I got this. It could be genetic. That's a different thing. You could have some genetic things, and they can be healed. I don't have to find out that you've been cursed. I don't have to find a generational curse. All I know is, all I need to know is, are you sick? I have it. I don't care how you got it. Jesus never asked how people got stuff. It doesn't matter because sick, sickness and sin, sickness came from the fall through the devil. The devil oppresses who gives us light, who gives us life, who gives us love. Jesus does. Who died on the cross and took it? Jesus did. Does this all make sense? This is very simple. Mm -hmm. So if you have something, I don't care how you got it, it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Amen? But I want you to see that you do not have a generational you're a believer. If you're not a believer, I almost said something. You're 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 going to hell. There's no. This is beyond a curse. You're not saved. If you're not a believer, you're not in covenant with God through Jesus. And so, when you when you perish, when you die, you're going to the bad place. You're I'm saying you're you're going to hell because you're not saved or redeemed from this thing. Amen. And so. People ask, well, what about unbelievers? Don't they have generational curses? They have something worse. <laughs> they're doomed. They're, they're condemned already. And you see what I'm saying? So, but as believers, as we go out into the world, it doesn't matter what the person is. It doesn't matter if they're a believer or not a believer. It doesn't matter their faith. You don't have authority over the person. You have authority over the sickness and the devil. Amen? And that's where your beef is. When you pray for people, don't worry about the person. You're setting that person free. Your beef is with the devil, the sin, or the, the sickness. Amen? When you go up to them, cancer, go in Jesus' name. Leukemia, go in Jesus' name. Diabetes, go in Jesus' name. And they'll be free. Mm -hmm. Amen. So then they, if they're not saved, wow, that's a huge sign to them that God loves them. And he leads them to the Lord, and he's filled with the Spirit, and disciples them. In a perfect world, he can do all that. But if you just heal them, that's good enough. Try to do more, but you don't have to. Jesus said, go into these villages and heal them. Amen. That was, there was no qualifier. Amen? In these villages, they, in, the, in the Gospels, there was no born-again people yet. And that didn't happen until the cross, and I beg to differ a little bit, until they got, until Jesus, until the Holy Spirit came. Anyway, but anyway, at the cross, that was where the new covenant started. Amen? That's when Amen. people were born again. Alright. So, one more. Go to John and John chapter 10. Let's, let's see how, if what I'm saying is true, if Jesus is the picture of what we're supposed to do, if Jesus is the model ministry of what we do, how did Jesus deal with generational curses? We're about to find out. Go to, um, I think it's John 10, it might be five. Hold on, one more second. I was bragging on myself, not needing this. I'm like, I forgot. get to this. It's going to be John 5. I knew it. John 5. Let's go to John 5 and verse 1. He starts out, bang. Uh, 
Did I say John 5? I said, I, mean, I meant John 9. <laughs> I'll get you there. John 9. John 9 and verse 1. All right, how did Jesus deal with a generation of curses? Because they certainly had a thought about that, I guess, back in that time. Because the disciples were going to ask them kind of crazy questions. All right, now Jesus, uh, John 9, verse 1. Now Jesus passed by. He saw a man who was blind from birth. Blind says when? Birth. He was born blind. That's pretty blind. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned that this man, was it this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The guy's blind since birth. And they're like, did he sin or did his parents sin that he's blind? You follow? So that encompasses the generation of curse, but also just destroys the sacred cow of if someone sins, does that sin stop God from healing them? No. Should that person repent of that sin and stop? Of course. But that's not the issue. The issue is God's grace over power and authority over the sickness or the blindness. All right, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? They were born blind. Jesus said, neither. This man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. And the night is coming when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Alright? He addressed it, but didn't really address it. He's like, neither one. He's blind. Uh, I, I have a warrior with us. You're healed. Boom, he's healed. And the academics is over. Nothing stopped him from he did, I don't think he even had a conversation with the blind man. It was really with the disciples. He just healed them. Amen? He didn't have to interview them. He didn't have to give them like three sheets of paper to figure out, you know, did you do this? Uh, did your father do these things? None, none of that. He healed them. Amen? So that is, that is our model when we go pray for people. That, we ask very few questions. We definitely don't need to bring generation of curses or find root causes. It doesn't matter. Because God's power and grace is greater than all those things. It's not a reward of what you do or don't do. It is the gift Amen. of God. Because Amen. he died, was beaten. God never changes. That's who he is. He's Jehovah Rapha. Sin came not from God, but through the fall. And God gave us his Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. Amen. So go find sick people and get them healed. Go find dead bodies and raise them up. Go find demons and cast them out. Go find blind people and get them healed. Amen. In Jesus' name. That's all I have. So uh, somebody's going to come up with announcements. But um, we're going to give you a few announcements uh, that's coming up this year and uh, ways to give and donate and, and help us out. If you want to partner in with a good seed, come on, man. Awesome way.
kingdomharvest.info is the website. Again, that's kingdomharvest.info is the website. If you look under the fields tab, there's specific ways that you can give, cash out, PayPal, the information is there. You can also give through Zelle. And the email for that is info.kingdomharvestinc at gmail.com. <laughs> And you can get through that. I don't know what it is tonight, but I can just laugh and laugh. It's just the joy of the Lord. I really do. Like, I feel so joyful. Okay. So, anyhow, that is what we are planning for. And, yeah, what a good word. So, I just want to end in a prayer. So, yeah. So, I'm sure we could all, like, raise your hand if you're here, if you've been healed by the Lord, physically or anything. So, I mean, he's the healer. I mean, it's just, I know this to be true. And, like, I've been saved for several decades and. When I was born again, I went to a church where they believed, you know, God healed. We see miracles. So I've definitely kind of grown up in the church since I've been saved with that. But it, again, it's just that that realization that it's paid for, that it's done, that we don't have to ask for it, that we can command it, that we can go out and do what we've been commissioned to do, to see people saved, to make disciples, to heal all who are oppressed. So it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. So yes, so I just want to say a prayer. So if you are watching this, if you have any sickness in your body, any ailment, I'm praying for you specifically. I'm just going to include all of us in this room too, myself included. If there's any sickness, anything, it has to go in Jesus' name. We know again it is by his stripes that you are healed and you just continue to stand on that word. And the word is powerful. I mean, the Bible tells us to renew our minds, to not be conformed to this word world that transformed by the renewing of our mind. So I just encourage you to get a hold of these scriptures. And you might find even as Russell teaches that you'll hear something you'll be like, hmm, is that right? Or hmm, like, or it's something that you might feel like you disagree with, or is that really what the Bible says? So just dig into the Word. Dig in and find out for yourself that all these scriptures that he's going over, just go, just go after it. Just go after it. So yes. Alrighty, so let us pray. Well, Father, first I just want to thank you for everybody who has come, everybody who's joined. I want to thank you, God, for a finished work. You did a finished work. Lord, we are so grateful for the cross, for the stripes of Jesus. We are grateful for the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our help, God, our just forever Lord and Savior. And so right now I'm just praying for everybody that's present everybody that is watching, and right now I command life to your body. I command you to be healed and whole. Father, even if it's not just a physical oppression, right now we take authority over all works of the enemy. We take authority over oppression in our own families, our own homes, every person that is viewing. And right now I command oppression, go in Jesus' name. Bodies be healed. We're not just even pray for minds. God, that just comes to my own personal thoughts right now. God, but any troubled thoughts, God, any, any um, troubled spots, troubled dreams, God, we just command all torment to go in Jesus' name. Every heaviness, God, every work of the enemy, we drive it out. We tell you to go in Jesus' name. Bodies be healed, all pain go, and bodies line up to the word and will of God in Christ Jesus. And we just thank you for it. Lord, I bless God, every person that's watching, God, you are more than enough. Father, so I just speak your abundance, your provision, God, your forgiveness. Even, Father, let people realize that. Lord, I know so many of us are Christians that are watching, and God, we are born again. But even as Russell spoke about those that do not know you, they are outside of that covenant. Father, so if any were to hear that don't know you, God, draw them to yourself. And Father, may they know that they can surrender. And give their lives to you, Lord, and just believe on the name of Jesus and be saved and be whole. And we just thank you, Lord. And, and Lord, just in advance, again, as it comes up in a thought, Lord, we just bless the service here Sunday morning. Father, all that you desire to do, Father, in the United Church, God, we bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.